Good morning and welcome to Frances Reads Her Bible with me, Frances Okiki. So today I'll be moving on to Genesis chapter 3. Yes, we're still in the book of Genesis. Disclaimer as always, I am not a pastor, I am not a minister, I am not any of the positions in the church. I am just a Christian reading her Bible. So, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 is about the fall of man or human disobedience. Reading, now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. And the snake asked the woman, you think the, the snake just ran to the woman and just asked her, no? That's not how the devil works. Cunning means he had to gather some intel, intelligence, you know, carry out some covert operation. How does Adam and Eve operate? You know, what does this man and woman do? Who should I speak to? And don't forget, most people think, um, Adam was the most important person that needed to fall. No, they both needed to. That's why we come to the New Testament. And God didn't just let any woman bear our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit had to come upon the Virgin Mary, you know, Mary, for her to be able to carry that our Lord Jesus Christ. Not just cleanse her from original sin, you know. So you see. Adam and Eve were really important for the purpose God had in store. Adam was created for a purpose and Eve was created to help him fulfill that purpose. You know, they were meant to work together. So the devil needed both of them to fall. And he had carried out his covert operation. I'm sure, like as always, these are my thoughts. I'm sure he knew, okay, if I meet Adam, Adam might not be able to convince Eve you know, and I need both of them to eat this fruit. Remember, this fruit is not an apple. I don't know why people keep saying it's an apple. This fruit, the, the fruit from the tree, no one knows what it looks like. Everybody has searched for that garden. Nobody has seen the garden. Nobody knows what it is. It's not an apple, you know. It's a fruit. It's not an apple. So nobody knows what it looks like. I remember, the devil knows, oh, if I speak to you, he has been monitoring them. Hello, monitoring spirits and familiar spirits, you know. He's been checking them out. So he had to be able to kill two birds with one stone. So he went to Eve. He knew, I'm sure he'd notice that once Eve, this woman, gives this man anything, he will just take it, you know. Because for some of some reason. But if he gives it to the man, the man might give it to the woman, and the woman will be like, no. But didn't you say God said, and no, she put up a fight. And it's only be one person that will eat it. So he needed to get the both of them, the man and the woman, in one fell soup. The lady was not unintelligent. She wasn't stupid. But the devil, like I said, he had carried out his intel. He studied them. He knew what they liked, what they didn't like, you know. He knew how to approach them. And he knew the right person to meet, you know. So he'd done his intelligence. And here he is now talking to Eve. And so he tells her, he asked her, okay, what did God tell you? And he said, and the lady, woman said, God said we may eat of the, the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. Remember in second Genesis, when God created Adam and put Adam in that apple, in that, sorry, in that garden to guard the garden. He'd given him explicit instructions. He was the one who'd received the explicit, explicit instructions, you know, to take care of the garden and guard it and not touch that fruit. And when Eve was created, we didn't see where God told Eve not to eat it, not to touch it. I'm sure Adam told her, oh, God said we shouldn't touch this. You know, so the devil, remember, the devil had done an assignment. He knew who to meet. And so the snake now replied, oh, that's not true. You will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you'll be like God and know what is good and what is bad. See, remember, she wasn't there when Adam was told about the tree. She was told by Adam and the devil had watched her, you know, observed her, 
he knew who he had to convince. Not because she was stupid, not because she was dumb, not because she was a woman. And I keep thinking women are not intelligent. He knew if he convinced this lady and she gives this fruit to the man, he was going to kill two birds with one stone. It would be so easy, you know. And that was exactly what the snake did. And I'm sure at that moment, Eve's engine was grinding like, hmm, really? So I'll know, I'll be like God, I know what is good and what is bad. Hmm. This snake was created, you know, when Adam was created in the garden as well. So maybe he knows something I don't, you know. Oh, I'm doing it. You know, she was just reasoning the whole thing. And it's one of my favorite Bible chapters in Genesis because it deals with human choice. See, the devil, Satan, the snake didn't deceive the woman. She had a choice when she heard what he told her. But she looked at the tree. She saw the tree was beautiful, how good and delicious the fruits looked from looking at it. And she thought, hmm, it would be wonderful to become wise, you know. So you see, she made a choice. The devil told her what he told her through the snake. And she made a choice and she ate the fruit. Then she took the fruit and gave some to her husband, Adam. And Adam also ate it. She didn't hide the fruit. Adam was the one who received explicit instructions about this tree. He knew what that fruit was. He, when he saw the fruits being given to him by Eve, he knew the fruit. She didn't hide it. She didn't bombard him with something or whatever. She didn't place a gun to his head and say, eat this fruit or else I'll never love you again. Eat this fruit or else I'll kill you. Eat this fruit or else you will die. Eat this fruit if you want to prove you love me. She didn't say nothing, you know. Adam made a choice. She, as her hand came out and gave him that fruit, he had a choice to say, no, 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 no. That's the fruit God said we shouldn't eat. I can't eat that fruit. I'm going to be disobeying God. No, I can't disobey God. No, that fruit. No, no. It's, but he took the fruit. Because, you know, God told him that he eat the fruit, he would die. He looked at the woman. Oh, you ate it and you didn't die. Oh, okay. He made a choice. I've been to churches where um, men of God will be talking about this particular Bible chapter and the verse. I'm like, the woman deceived. No, he wasn't deceived. She didn't lie to him. He saw the fruit. He knew what fruit it was. Right from when God told him, don't eat that fruit. He knows the fruit. But she gave him the fruit. She didn't force it. She didn't force feed him. She stretched out her hand to give it to him. He saw the fruit and he took some of it and he ate it. He made a choice. If you're dating someone or you're married to a man or a woman and they tell you, let's go to the top of that building and jump from it and die together. I know if you both jump, you're also going to die. Will you go jump with them because you're married to them? Or you're dating him or her? Or they tell you, oh, let's go somewhere and kill people. As soon as they had eaten it, just look at verse 7. Verse 7 reminds me of, you know, like when you watch all these sci-fi movies, like artificial intelligence, you know, when they receive human consciousness, when they receive human consciousness, like now they are now human, like they start acting like human beings, having feelings, emotions, and all that. That's what this verse 7 reminds me of. Like their eyes now became open, you know. They now realized, oh, this is what we are, where we are. You know? So verse 8, when they heard God walking in the garden in the evening, they hid from him among the trees. Then God called out to the man, you know, according to verse 9. And the man answered in verse 10, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid and hid from you because I was naked. It, it's like this was the telling or the knowing because, you know, they were innocent. Then they had no consciousness, understanding of, you know, the, the, 
being naked was bad or something. And when immediately he said that, God realized, hmm, I'm sure God already knew what they'd done. Emily, he said that God now asked him, so who told you that you were naked? God knew from that answer that those guys have eaten that fruit. Did you eat the fruit I told you not to eat? And this is where it gets interesting to me. Instead of the man accepting he made a choice, you know, Adam saying, oh, I made a mistake. I'm sorry I disobeyed you. I'm so sorry. A lot of people do this. They put the blame on someone else. He goes to the woman you put here with me gave me the fruit and I ate it. So he wasn't just blaming the woman, Eve, for giving him the fruit. He was also blaming God for giving him the woman, as in putting the woman there with him when I gave him the fruit and he ate it. You know, people receive, refusing to accept responsibility for their actions. Lots of people do that. They, they play the victim, they blame someone else. Like you date, okay, let's say you get married to somebody and this one is the wrong choice and he he or she turned out wrong, then you now start blaming God. But sometimes there were signs in the beginning of the relationship you refused to listen to or refused to see, you know, and then you went in and married that person. I think responsibility is knowing, oh yeah, I made a mistake. I chose this wrong person. It wasn't just the person. I also had had responsibility in this situation by because i chose this person i'm not saying blaming yourself but accepting the responsibility that i did wrong i chose this person or let's say you're in a, you know god said don't commit fornication or adultery and then you as a young woman or as a man okay, let me use the one young woman because i'm a woman you have sex with a man you're not married to you commit fornication and then you get pregnant and then the man refuses to accept responsibility for the baby you know then you go for an abortion and you kill the child or you die you know all i'm just trying to say is a lot of us don't accept responsibility for our actions and our choices then you get an abortion and then you die in the process then you get to heaven or you get before judgment and then you tell God, um, it was that guy I was dating. He made me get an abortion. You know, he made me have sex with him. No, you made a choice. He didn't rape you. You know, he kissed you, but you didn't want, because you didn't want to lose the relationship or you wanted to prove you loved him or something, you agreed. And then you were enjoying the sensation of being kissed and whatnot. You had sex. So we all have choices. See? Even Adam, even Eve, the woman, blamed the serpent, the snake. Everybody blamed everybody. Nobody agreed to accept responsibility for their choices and their actions. And that's why I believe God punished everyone when he pronounced judgment. He punished everyone because they were all culpable. Everyone had a choice. You know, he punished the snake and said, I'm just trying to imagine what the snake looked like before him. Maybe he could walk. Maybe snakes could walk. Maybe snakes would. I think spiritually, the snake is the devil, you know. Then he says to the woman, I will increase your trouble from verse 16. Increase your trouble in pregnancy and your pain in giving birth. In spite of this, as in spite of being, um, having pains when giving birth, she would always want her husband, like desire. And then you'll be, yet you'll be subject to him. People took that yet you'll be subject to him to mean women are meant to be slaves to men or women as second class citizens i don't understand it god was referring to the process of giving birth you know it's painful it's hard i've i've never given birth before i've never been pregnant but you know i have friends who've given birth who have kids even my sister and labor is <laughs> just the process alone of being pregnant is it's something then the process of now giving birth as a whole level on its own, the pain and all that. God was trying to say that if despite all that pain, you will still want to have sex with your husband, you will still desire him, you will still have attraction towards him, you will still lust and want him, even after going through all that pain of giving birth to children. And you'll be subject to him means you'll be subject to his 
he can decide not to have sex with you or not you know and all that you'll be subject to him would also mean he will be the head of the home you know make which makes it look like um eve and ada maybe they were on power of sorts at the time and this was her punishment it doesn't mean god saying that you'll be subject to him means you become a servant to a man or you become a slave like you you i put you to serve the man yeah he's subject now he's his slave no that's not what it means you know and then see the person with the largest verse or should i say judgment was adam just look at it from verse 17 all the way down to 19 was all for adam because and the woman just got one verse which was 16 because adam adam was the one who god had put in charge of that garden to guard the garden to protect the garden to take care of the garden he was the one god had pointed that tree out to that tree don't touch it you know and then he he disobeyed and instead of accepting responsibility for his actions he blamed the woman and he blamed god for giving him the woman but he had a choice and i'm sure god was unhappy with him you know and he said you listened to your wife and he ate the fruit which i told you not to eat god had told him it was the person who was giving and you know and instead of saying god i'm sorry god please forgive me i'm so sorry i disobeyed you i'm so, so please lord i forgive he blamed it on the woman and blamed god i think a lot of us do this today you know we don't accept responsibility for our actions we blame other people for the choices we made that they, they didn't force us to they didn't put a gun to our heads and tell us do this or else you die you know even then that's why we have matters you know they said no i'm never going to disobey god but adam willfully did it he disobeyed god you know and god punished him for it so adam named his wife eve this is where she was named and because she was the mother of all human beings you know mm. you being the mother or the queen does not necessarily mean you were the first person to be created but like i said adam was god's chosen created for a special purpose it's like you creating as fully intelligence and whatnot and say okay yeah this one even though this was not the first prototype this is the most you know this is the best type and you make that one the best ab above all others you know and he said this is the queen this is the king so you know you you being the king or a queen doesn't necessarily mean you're the first you know so like I said, Adam wasn't the first human being, man to be created. In Genesis 1, God had created a male and female and scattered them all over the earth already. And like, ah, oh, Francis, what do you mean? Well, as we move ahead, you will see there were other human beings on earth aside Adam and Eve. And so God made clothes out of animal skins for them and coated them and sent them on their way, which is going to happen in the next verse. So now God is speaking to Trinity and to the other heavenly hosts. Now these human beings have become like one of us and have knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You know, because it's like artificial intelligence receiving human consciousness and there's some other level you don't want them to get to. And then you like, okay, no, it's time to get them out of this place, get them out of the garden. So you send them out of the garden and made them cultivate the soil from which they had been formed. Because before then, Adam's job was just to guard the garden, protect it, you know, name it, take care of it. He wasn't, the, the land was fertile, you know. His purpose was clear, and now he has to work really hard, you know. So then at the east side of the garden, God put living creatures and a flaming sword, which turned in all directions. Remember I said the location of this Garden of Eden was between Sudan, Ethiopia, then parts of Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and um, Syria. So that's north, north, northern Africa and parts of, yeah, they're yeah, more like Arabs in that part. But then you know what I'm saying? This garden, nobody has found this garden. Nobody has found the tree. People just call it an apple. It's not an apple. It's not an apple. People don't know where this garden is located. They've been searching, searching. And then the shall never be found because it was hid spiritually. That's what I believe. Because people don't see cherubim. Cher the cherubim are the living creatures. 
we will see them in the book of Jeremiah and um, I think what's the other book? The living creatures are the cherubim. They have um four parts the head of a lion, bear um head of a lion, human, bull and an eagle. Yes, the four living the living creatures are cherubims. So cherubims have been put in God. We don't see angels with our bare eyes, you know. We can't see them with our human eyes. It's spiritual. So that garden, people have searched and searched for the tree of life, searched. It shall never, never be found. I don't think it will be found. It's spiritual. It's been hidden spiritually, so it can't be found right now. The location was put on earth physically, but now I don't think any human being will find that until when God wants it to be found. So yeah, cherubims are there guarding it. And it's, like I said, it was, it's weird that the region where the garden was, the Garden of Eden was on earth, has been filled with so much strife, wars, killings, and so much more. So nobody can come near that tree anymore. Nobody's going to find it. So I'm, I'm going to stop here because I think this has become longer than I had hoped it to be. So tomorrow we'll move on to Genesis chapter 4. Oh yes, I have a series called Young Single Christian Sex Talk on YouTube on my channel. You know, if you want, you could check it out. It could be of help to you. Hopefully, I hope so. Or maybe just add to your knowledge. As always, these are my thoughts. As imperfect as they are. And I hope they help you somehow. Until next time, tomorrow when I come your way again. My name is Frances Okeke. And this is Frances Reads Her Bible. Bye. And have a blessed day.